Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a preview of this week's Classics Today insider-only video, the best of Otto Klemperer, since we're covering conductors. I want to do a little summary, because this is now the third in this series. Previously, we did Bernard Heitink, and we did Arturo Toscanini, all of which are available if you subscribe as a Classics Today insider for only $49.95 or something like that per year, a whole year. It's a steal. It really is. But that's not the point. What I want to talk about is, do conductors get better as they age? I mean, aging to a point where they're still like conscious and moving, not aging to the point where they should have been hauled off and, 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 and you know, moved into an assisted living facility decades previously, because that happens too. Conductors never know when to quit, and they surround themselves by people who continuously tell them how wonderful they are and who make it possible for them to continue, whether they're actually conducting or not. That happened with Otto Klemperer. Klemperer famously, in one of his early, 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 uh, early, what am I saying? One of his late, 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 late recordings. It was Schumann's Third Symphony. It's one of the last recordings he made in the late 1960s or early 70s or something. I don't know. It's one of his late ones. And he had, he sat, he conducted sitting down. He, he had quite the traumatic life. You know, he, he was a manic depressive who had, you know, some serious issues with mental health issues. And then he set himself on fire. I don't mean to laugh. It was very serious. He burned himself terribly. And, it, you know, it was all in connection, too, with his, his, his manic activity, which was, you know, running around at night, you know, hitting bars and sort of fooling around when he was when in his 70s. And it was really, really wacky. I mean, it was really wacky. So here was this old, old man, tall, gaunt, and grim, and they would wheel him in front of the orchestra, and he would supposedly conduct. And uh, the famous story about Schumann's Renner Symphony is that he fell asleep in the middle of the session and woke up at the end of it when everyone had finished and said, how did it go? <laughs> and that was his recording of Schumann's Renner Symphony. And if you listen to it, you can believe it because it is stiff as a board slow and metronomic, as though the person who was supposed to be guiding the people in front had temporarily nodded off in the middle of it. It really is kind of astonishing. And it was released. So there you go. But I don't think that the mystique of even the greatest conductor operates when they're comatose. So that's an interesting question. And the three conductors that we've looked at so far all sort of answer this question rather differently. In Heiting's case, it seems to me that he did not get better as he got older. He had a, a prime, and the prime was a few years after he started uh, working with the Concertgebouw, after he got the Concertgebouw, because uh, we can tell because of the recordings. Remember, there was a Mahler one, one of the first things he did, and it was fresh and it was nice, and a Mahler four. They were, they were rather, rather, um, how shall I say, uh, non-interventionist to the point of disappearance. They were just wonderful performances by the Concertgebouw, but you couldn't say there was any particular guiding spirit on the podium. But then he remade them with the Concertgebouw, and the remakes were, generally speaking, substantially better, especially the Mahler one, much, much better. The same was true of Bruckner Seventh. The first was Bruckner, and the second was one of the great Bruckner Sevens out there. And there's a difference. There's a difference between the ones that get horse, horse accompaniments and the ones that don't. But after Heiting left the Concertgebouw, with, with whom he had a very long, you know, multi-decade relationship and made tons and tons of recordings, he started guest conducting everywhere in the universe, and he remade all of the same repertoire. And most of the time, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, it wasn't as good. It wasn't as interesting. I think, I think he was one of those conductors who needed a collaboration, a true collaboration with a, a great orchestra to bring out the best in, in him. In him, 
because the orchestra was always going to be great. And one of those things the collaborations show is that, as I've always said, great orchestras are much better than most great conductors because they know the music. They know it cold. And the opportunity for a somewhat unassuming, rather dour guy like Heitink to make an impression um, requires, I think, an active working relationship where they know each other well and where his, his ideas, which are not of the most interventionist kind, can be realized in terms of exceptional orchestral playing and some of the finer qualities or the less obvious qualities of interpretation. So that's one example. The next one was Toscanini. Now, Toscanini, most of his recordings were made in the latter third of his life, only because recordings only existed in the latter third of his life. I mean, the guy who was born in 1867. There is a myth concerning Toscanini's recordings that as he got older, he tended to get stiffer and faster and, and you know, less flexible. That's true to a point. I, I think it is. But on the other hand, it's, it's a false comparison to the extent that he was not recorded equally at all stages of his life. Obviously, his first recordings are early acoustic recordings, and they fit on a couple of CDs. There's very, very few of them. And similarly, his New York Philharmonic recordings, while there are more sort of broadcast things available, um, they do not really, I think, establish definitively the fact that as he got older, he became X as opposed to Y. We just don't have a representative sample from every stage of his life. So he might have been somewhat stiff and unyielding at all points of his life. We just didn't have those recordings. We don't know. We really don't know. What we do know is that his later performances, I think, were not necessarily more anything than his earlier performances. In other words, he was always a very questing kind of a questing spirit. And, and his interpretive ideas changed rather substantially sometimes between performances, depending on the work. So there's no way to tell. Toscanini was a great conductor at all phases of his life. That we know. And that's what the recordings tell us in the absence of a substantive sample. Now, Klemperer, who will be the subject of the ClassicsToday.com Insider video, is a, another fascinating case because he also, he's a little bit like Toscanini in that he was not recorded equally at all phases of his life. And because of his manic depressiveness, his interpretations could vary unbelievably wildly. He calmed down as he got older. Uh, he stabilized, his personality stabilized around the, the 50s and into the 60s. And so what we have and what was created for him really by having Walter Legg bring him to conduct the Philharmonia was, was very much an atypical persona if you look at what his career was. Klemper was a modern music guy. When he led the Kroll Opera in, in Germany, I, he, did, he did fabulous things with with modern music. He, he conducted Janicek operas. He conducted all kinds of experimental stuff. He commissioned Kurt Weill's Kleine Dreigroschen Musik and, and other works of that type. He was, he, was, he was also an early music guy. He was one of the first people to play Bach and those composers without vibrato, believe it or not. Which means, of course, we know that because he was doing it without vibrato in the 1930s, that everybody was doing it with vibrato before then. Another reason why the period instrument people are nuts. But we know from Klemperer's example, he was not a, a sentimental conductor at all. And so, and so his performances, the ones we have from before the Philharmonia legacy, the EMI legacy, tend to be, tend to be all over the place. And those Vox recordings he did were, you know, sort of scruffy sonically and the playing was kind of scruffy and the interpretations were, were they just weren't very good. We have some, conduct, some performances from his period of when he was a conductor in Hungary and they show a very, very different guy, a very different guy. So the Klemperer that we know, the great Klemperer, was very much a, a function of his old age and his medical well-being combined. And so there's another case in point. There is also a bit of a myth, and I, I am guilty of spreading it, I have to say, that conductors in the earlier period 
um, in earlier periods were aware of the fact that the privilege of making a recording did not happen all that frequently. And therefore, they had to be sure that what they were doing was something that they had considered and that would be preserved. And, uh, you know, that I think was true sometimes and true not other times. It depended on the conductor. We're a little bit, we're a little bit, I'm a little bit jaded because conductors today remake things at the drop of a hat. I mean, when you started with someone like Karajan, who did four and five versions of symphonies by Beethoven and Tchaikovsky and, and, and Brahms, and, you know, it was just ridiculous to have, and virtually the same interpretations. And nowadays, when we have live recordings versus studio recordings, and we can make all these comparisons of the same conductors doing the same music, we realize that what we thought may have been the studio recording that is the most deeply considered permanent document of the invariable interpretation of the work is simply what was available. We had nothing else to compare it to. And so that's how it acquired that reputation. By the way, I don't think that's a bad reputation for it to acquire. I really don't. But I think that's probably what happened. And so, and so one of the things we've learned now with everything available at one point or another is that you really can't judge. You have to take each person as they come and look at their discography in a critical way and see what it actually tells us, what the facts of the matter are. And so the facts of the matter with Klemper is that we're going to be listening to his best Philharmonia recordings because that's where his best stuff is. There really is nothing before that that we need to worry about. And that makes life easy for us as, uh, as listeners and collectors, I think, or easier. So I do hope that you will please subscribe to Classics Today Insider if you haven't already so that you can enjoy this growing series. It's going to be lots and lots of fun. And we're going to be covering conductors and pianists and violinists and orchestras and ensembles and string quartets and everything over the next few years. We're going to have lots and lots of time to do lots and lots of videos and discuss lots and lots of artists and find out what we think their best recordings are. And I am very, very much looking forward to doing that with you. These are ad free. Um, as subscribers, you don't have to watch ads. And I, I, the response so far has been tremendous. So I appreciate and thank all of the people, um, all of you who have recently become or renewed your insider subscriptions. There's a sign up link for Classics Today Insider in the description of this video. All you have to do is click on it and go there. So keep on listening, folks. I'll see you over at Classics Today Insider. Take care.